Hi everyone, thank you so much for coming. My name is Emily Lawson. I am a senior in the College of Arts and Sciences and, and I'm studying political science and a minor in, in French and African studies. Um, and so the topic of my Keystone project is the intense conflict in Senegal and looking at the lived experience. Um, so this has been, Senegal has become a country very close to my heart throughout my four years here at BU. Um, first starting out through my studying of French and Francophone literature and then um, through my extended study of Wolof, so it's really become something extremely important to me, so start. Um, so the research question I started out with is looking at uh, the entrenched conflict in Senegal, um, which I'll explain more later. Um, so basically just looking at what is the lived experience, so what is the day-to-day -day of someone living in Senegal look like and what, how does the conflict impact their experience? Um, and so this question really started to guide my research and formulated my survey questions that I went into Senegal with um, and kind of just served as the basis for my research. Um, and then after I came back from Senegal um, and kind of looked at the interviews I had done and the data I had collected, I kind of formulated a new question that kind of is a bit broader and also just fits the data I collected. And so that is how is the possibility for change perceived amongst the general Senegalese population. And so just to provide you a bit of context, um, Senegal is a West African country um, with a population of about 14 and a bit million people. Um, it's a former French colony, which is also very important to know. Um, so French is the official language, which is um, how I was able to do most of my interviews. Um, and also, um, so the thing that is really important here is the Casamance region, is which I, I was studying, which is the darker blue region. Um, and so the space in between the Casamance and the rest of Senegal is not just empty space, that's actually another country, the Gambia, um, which is a reflection of colonial borders and um, because the Gambia was originally a, a British colony. Um, so the Casamance region is a very unique region. Um, it has a very distinct geography in terms of um, the rest of Senegal is primarily in desert, um, but Casamance is much more green and um, more suited for agriculture. Um, and the language is also very different. Uh, Wolof is the, the lingua franca in the rest of, or for the majority of um, Senegal, but there is a more um, linguistic diversity in Casamance, um, Jola being a very prominent language as well. Um, with religion as well, Mos um, Islam is the majority of the um, religion in Senegal, but there is more um, religious diversity in Casamance as well. Um, ethnicity, same thing. Um, and then colonial history is also super important to keep in mind. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, because the Casamance started out originally as a Portuguese colony before the French then took over. Um, and as well as resources, as I said earlier, it's much more um, agriculturally sound. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and so what I'm studying is the separatist movement. And so this began in 1982, so that makes it one of the longest running conflicts in um, the African continent. Um, and so it's run by the Mouvement des Forces Démocratiques de la Casamance, um, or MFDC. Um, and so this is a largely political movement looking to have a distinct region or country from the rest of Senegal. Um, however, it is a relatively low intensity conflict. So around, um, this, sorry, it's a typo. It's supposed to be three to 5,000 deaths um, throughout the 30 years or 30 plus years. <coughs> Um, with many more being displaced internally and externally. Um, so what is really important about my project and what I've taken away from it um, has been the methodology. So this past summer, I spent six weeks in Senegal um, living with um, a host family and really getting immersed in the culture and um, also taking Wolof lessons, of course. Um, and so while I was there, I did 19 in-depth interviews and these were conducted primarily in French. Um, for those who felt comfortable, they were done in English, so that it was better for me <laughs> um, and my transcribing later. Um, but also, Wolof was used um, to kind of break the ice and get more comfortable with those being interviewed. Um, and so this is just a general breakdown um, of th demographic things that I thought were important um, going into it. So looking at people like. What's the experience of someone who's only been alive during the conflict? And what's the experience of someone who's known the time before then? Um, and also location was super important. So I interviewed people in both Dakar and Ziegenshore, which is the capital, de facto capital of the um, 
the Casa Mons region. Um, so what is their experience, how does their experience differ? Um, ethnicity is, I thought would play a larger role, but um, in, I interviewed people of a larger ethnic diversity than I initially anticipated, um, and as well, gender. Um, and so now I'm gonna talk a bit about what I found. Um, so through um, these interviews, I kind of just wanted to gauge what was people's perceptions of the conflict and how um, they saw the possibility for change. And so these are three things that there was general consensus on um, across um, most of the interviews. So the first one is conflict duration. Um, most people agreed to the fact that it's just, um, it's frustrating the fact that it's been going on for so many years. Um, and then another thing that people noticed was that although it's been going on for so long, it's definitely been improving in the past, um, in recent years. And as well, um, people noticed a lot of the, eco the negative economic effects, not only on um, the region of the Casamans itself, but on the rest of the country. Um, and so this is, I'm gonna talk a bit about the two, there's two um, main sections of where there were differing opinions. Um, so, are things that I found most interesting. So the first one is um, people's opinions on the, why the conflict has continued. So and looking at who is responsible or what is responsible um, for the length of the conflict. Um, so I won't go into too much detail about these, but um, these five things I thought were the most apparent. Um, so people saying uh, that the government is responsible or it's the rebel group, so seeing where people lie in that spectrum of who they see is in charge. Um, and so the next thing that people, there were differing opinions on um, is the possibility for change. Um, so what this meet look is looking at as who do they people see as being, or having the power or the ability to create change within their community and to um, solve the conflict or and you make any kind of impact on it. Um, I thought this was extremely um, telling of the people that are important to these people because um, kind of seeing as what they see the future of this conflict as being. Um, so this is where I found the most interesting results in my interviews. Um, the first one being the role of religion, which is not something I had originally um, considered in going into it because it's not something I've ever really studied. So that was really, um, intriguing and um, noteworthy for me in seeing that um, how, what role does God play in being able to make change in the conflict and how, um, especially from my perspective, how religion plays a much different role in everyday life in Senegal. <coughs> and then also um, the government and the MFEDC leaders, so like the elites and having power to enact change, which is um, often uh, something you see in making political change, you assume that those people are the ones who hold that responsibility. Um, but another, I think the last one is very important as well as the idea that the Senegalese people themselves have the power and the ability to make this change. Um, but what was particularly interesting about the last point is that um, while many noted that the solution and the change has to come from us being the Senegalese people, um, there was very rarely Actually, no one really said, um, like, th I can take steps X, Y, and Z to do this. Um, so it's more of just an idea of a collective as opposed to individual action. Um, and so basically, um, as a result of these interviews and the experience that I had, um, what I can like draw from this and think about other conflicts is that um, people's perceptions of power and their own personal ability vary def like a lot, especially in terms of entrenched conflict because it becomes so much a part of your experience if it's all you've ever known, um, especially if something's gone on for over 30 years. Um, and so basically, it's looking, you can apply, like, look at other conflicts like this and see how um, people understand the conflict and then think about ways that you can kind of improve the co other conflicts like this and kind of just contribute to a broader understanding of this experience. Um, so those are my basic things. So I'm gonna leave time for questions.
gender? Did you notice any differences um, in terms of that, like where they saw a possibility for change, like in terms of religion or government or just that kind of thing? So definitely my, inter well, that's one of the limitations of my um, interview collection was the sample size was very small um, and the people I uh, was able to interview was kind of selective so um, I would have liked to have interviewed a, like a more general or a more representative population um, but with the interviews that I did receive the one thing I would note um, this is hardly a conclusion I could draw but um, like the only people who mentioned like education or investing in the future generations were women um, so that's something to which I found interesting. So, yeah. yeah. So did you see any um, involvement of neighboring countries? I mean, oftentimes in these long-standing conflicts, there are all kinds of conspiracies. <coughs> right. From your own observations, was there a neighbor that was sort of um, pointed to more than others? Definitely. Um, that should. That's something that was extremely important. Um, external actors are um, were very prevalent in this discussion of the conflict. Um, be, especially in a country like Senegal, which is so interconnected with its neighboring country, with the Gambia and Guinea-Bissau, um, and there's there are, oh, there was some people who pointed to those countries as being perpetrators of the conflict and contributing arms or contributing funds to the rebel groups, um, while others noted the um, fact that there's so much interconnectedness. Like my family lives in Guinea-Bissau. I'm from Guinea-Bissau. I live in Senegal now, and how. Um, others pointed out that it has to be um, a solution has to come from not only the Senegalese people but from this population as a whole. So it's kind of both sides. Any other questions? Yeah. So what's the relationship between the governments of the Gambia and Senegal? Are they um, you know, friendly or is it? Um, yeah, so it's definitely there's a lot of like interconnectedness between all of the countries um, so it's it's very interesting especially with the idea of borders um, just because the Gambia is right smack in the middle of Senegal um, there has to be some level of um, cooperation between governments um, but in terms of it's I would from what I learned it's difficult for me to say exactly like what is the extent of like the discussions about the conflict between governments. Um, I think it's more, at least from what my perspective and what my data I collect is more of the people as being connected between these countries. So I noticed that you had um, uh, some of the uh, interview candidates were born before the conflict started and some born after. <coughs> I'm curious if you noticed any uh, tangible differences between their perspectives, you know, some who grew up with the conflict happening already who saw, you know, life before it Yeah, so that was definitely a point brought up by a lot of um, the, the younger people I interviewed saying, well, I don't really know, what, I don't I have no concept of really what life was like before the conflict, so it's hard to compare, but then um, a lot of, when I guess the biggest trend I would recognize from like the age difference was kind of just more of the tangible um, impacts of the conflict, so things like economic um, effects that they've experienced, like not being able to work on your farm anymore because there's landmines and things like that, no, like noticeable life shifts um, for people um, that they had this experience of their life before the conflict and now this is what their experience is. Mm -hmm. Did you notice any difference in the way those two groups approached resolving the conflict? Um, this was less of like an obvious trend, I'd say. Um, I think, in I think it was like not noticed, like super noticeable, but a little bit more of um, the younger population was more saying it's, it has to be the Senegalese people and things like that. And but it w that's not like across the board. That was just slightly more. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much.